Yeah, welcome back to Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel and Think Tech. We're going to re-examine the canyons of Kaka'ako. Indeed, they are. Uh, with somebody who's been thinking about Kaka'ako for years and years uh, with the AIA and as a, what do I want to call it, it is, an aesthetically minded architect who has practiced for hundreds of years in this city, <laughs> Scott Wilson. Hi, Scott. <laughs> yes. Well, greetings from the uh, Pleistocene era. Uh, I didn't realize I was quite that old. <laughs> uh, greetings, Jay. <laughs> greetings. Well, you know, you and I spent plenty of time in uh, AIA meetings about Kaka'ako. It was, it was an effort to, of architects in general to try to weigh in and have a say about what was going on. I remember uh, Neil Abercrombie wanted this uh, huge phallic tower. Uh, it was like 38 stories high. It was really extraordinary. And then the big guys came in and uh, they, they gave us... Um, they gave us images of um, of, uh, of 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 Chinzano tables and uh, streets that, that curved one way or the other, and bicycle paths and pedestrian paths and little you know European shops. It was going to be like a city in Europe. It, it looked like, and uh, and here we are. It must be what five, six, seven years later, uh, and uh, we don't have that. It, it, it disappeared like a puff of smoke. Um, and so I would like to look back with you and re-examine the canyons of Kaka'ako, those, those 40 foot concrete uh, uh, you know, walls going straight up, escarpments is what they are, um, and figure out with you, you know, what happened and where are we now and where can we be? And is, is there hope? This is another alternative title. Is there still <laughs> hope for Kaka'ako? Scott, tell us about yeah. your thoughts about Kaka'ako. Yeah, Jay, it, it, it is, um, you, you have to remember that Kakako is a city within the city. Uh, it, it, is, it is governed by the HCDA, and it was legislated that way because uh, the, uh, the mayor at the time, uh, Frank Fossey, uh, had neglected that critical part of the center of the city. So he, so the legislator yanked, legislature yanked it away and created a, an entirely separate district um, and gave it to an entirely different planning agency, which is the HCDA. So um, to, to uh, go back about 10 years, um, when, when the towers first started coming up, there was a lot of public outcry and a lot of public skepticism that this was, this was gonna become a weird sci-fi futuristic world that nobody, who grew up in Hawaii would would relate to, and it, and it would be it would be very alienating. And the AIA and the Urban Design Committee of the AIA actually commissioned a giant model to be built by the students up at the UH Architecture School, and we had that down. And, and it was like twelve feet by twelve feet. It was enormous. Uh, and and we put that in the in the AIA office on Fort Street Mall to try to to try to explain to people with, with workshops uh, that this is what you are looking at, that, there, that that's where you're gonna be, there's the street that you know, here's the building that's gonna go on the street. But um, the, um, the reason that Kakako uh, is so, so different is because it's, entire, it's on an entirely different building code from the rest of the city. It's, it's a form-based, zoning code and and the and the rest of the city of Honolulu is in the Euclidean uh, which, which is sort of a function based code uh, which determines the size the shape the location of buildings and the um, the the good part about Kakako is is the um, is the fact that they're that they mandated that buildings be built right to the sidewalk because that creates a much more interesting walking environment for pedestrians. You have you have shops, you have retail use right on the street, and that's a good thing. I mean, when we we think of the ideal, we think of Greenwich Village in New York, we think of uh, North Village in uh, in Boston. These are wonderful walking streets with little shops, both sides, trees, lots of people, very safe, fascinating. Uh, you know, it's a place that people love to get out of their car and, and just walk. Um, 
So that was kind of the that was kind of the original intent of Kakako, was to create this uh, more uh, intensive use of continuous street frontage, uh, walking environments with with lots of shops. Um, what I think what I think hasn't worked out is that is that HCDA was kind of uh, twisted by developers to to allow these parking podiums to go uh, up above the shops. And that's where we end up getting these 80 foot tall canyons that you that you are lamenting. And I really think that that is where we have gone wrong. Uh, all you have to do is walk around the Whole Foods building to realize, oh my God, I, I feel like an ant in, in, a, in a canyon. Uh, and and to realize they have they let it go too far uh that the walking environment is has become alienating but there is hope because that's just one block of kakako there's you know 40 other blocks in kakako yet to be built so uh, there's hope oh let me there's so many things to unpack from that <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, tr I tried to give a, a quick overview. Uh, you know, there, there's a history. There are some good things. There are some really good things. I mean, you in in looking at Kakako, you realize how badly the rest of Honolulu has been served by the Euclidean zoning code because it it created these parking lots on the streets. It created these strip malls that are. 100 feet be behind the street and we lost all we, we became a car city when we were actually a very charming walking city it, it, as of about 1940 so yeah. so kakako is is a return in some ways to a more compact uh intensive use of of land it's just that we the pendulum has swung too far uh, to one extreme. Yeah, you know, uh, just a couple of thoughts, many, many thoughts on what you've said. When I when I came out here, uh, I was assigned here, you know, by the Coast Guard, and uh, they said, well, you can go to St. Louis, you can go to Honolulu. I said, I think I'll go to Honolulu. <laughs> Good choice. Yeah. They said, you know, they're trying to convince me, and they said, it's a great walking city. And it's, you know, it's got charm in every direction. And it's one of the reasons I came out here. And indeed, when I came out here, you know, Chinatown and the whole central business yeah. district was really charming and little shops and mom and pops and all those things. And you could really enjoy yourself. At the same time, you could also drive to those places. So it was the best of both worlds. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you had this kind of... Uh, little little town you know um but that's that's a good point i forgot to say i i shouldn't sort of write off everything outside of kakako because we have our special districts and chinatown is one of them and and waikiki is one of them and what do you see there great walking environments because they have been exempted from the the parking rules and the setback rules of the rest of the city so they've done a fantastic job in Chinatown. I mean, Chinatown has its problems, but physically, it's a charming little low-rise walking uh, retail environment. And it and it's and it, it you know we know it lacks it has some other problems. But and then Waikiki again, um, Kalakaua Avenue is probably one of the top ten walking streets in the world. It is it, when Kalakaua is busy. When when our pre-COVID, when you think back to pre-COVID Waikiki, that place would be packed at, at ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, midnight, um, with people from all over the world. And truly, it was it was a great walking street, and it and it still is. It it will recover. Uh, in fact, it's already it's already recovering, as you know. So um, Kaka'ako, when when the, all the noise came out about fixing up Kaka'ako and HCDA is going to do all this amazing stuff, uh, it took probably 20 years or more from the time HCDA was established to the time anybody really gave a rip and the developers came in there and they built stuff. It was more like the um, automobile re repair shops. 
Uh, and, you know, there were a couple of houses of ill repute that lived in there. Uh, there was extraordinary waste. And considering that it was, um, you know, just a, a few blocks away from downtown. So a part of the argument to develop Kaka'ako only, what, 10, 15 years ago, uh, even though it had been dormant for a long time, um, was that this is going to be an extension of the downtown. It is going to enhance the downtown. It is going to give us a larger, better, more robust, more aesthetic downtown. And I said to myself, gee whiz, how are they going to do that? Because HCDA doesn't con you know, control downtown and downtown doesn't control HCDA. And how they get it? You know, this really requires, uh, you know, it, it requires sacrifice by developers. It requires very careful thinking by planners and by, um, you know, uh, planning permitting agencies in, in the city and for that matter, the state. Because I know that although D HCDA was involved in you know, establishing the guidelines, DPP was also involved. Um, and they, they had something to say. They had the same power uh, that they had with other parts of the city, but they, they did have some power um, and they allowed some things to happen that really were not so good. So when you, when you consider that, when you consider what we were told about mm -hmm. what was going to happen there and how it was going to be this, you know, re, 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 re envisioning of the downtown area and how it was, it was going to be people could live there and then walk to their jobs, right? And or bike to their jobs. It would be all of those planning points all rolled into one, and it would be happiness beyond description. Um, <laughs> and, but none of that really happened, did it? You're right. Is that when I think back to the earliest kind of promotion of Kakako, I kept hearing the phrase live, work, and play all in one it was going to be it was going to be a neighborhood where you could live work and play you could go to the beach you could walk to your job in downtown you could you could go over to ala Moana and do your shopping so those those locational functions are are still there it's just that um what we're seeing right now is the is the low-hanging fruit that developers are grabbing which is the luxury condo projects that can that have a great view of the beach uh so i i really think the the further development of kakako is inland obviously they're they're running out of beachfront and you know highway front land so they are starting to move inland and that's where you're seeing more affordable housing you're seeing that artists housing uh, project off of Kapiolani, you're seeing um, affordable housing on Ward Avenue. So I, I think this is going to be the next phase of, um, of construction because um, there, there's... I hope so, but does it pencil yeah. out? You know, because, um, you know, when uh, the Howard Hughes Corporation got in there and built those condos, it was one condo that they built was $100 million. Yeah, um, I think it sold for just about that. It's extraordinary. Yeah. That was like a that you know, that's when the bell rings at the state fair. You know, bang, uh, hundred million dollars is a new world. Um, yeah. And then, of course, uh, you don't want to have riffraff in your ap apartment building, so you have a lot of security, and mm -hmm. you have those uh, escarpments and canyons outside. Yeah. And uh, and you, but on the other hand, you look down at the beach. Um, um, and, you know, you, you have that exquisite opportunity. I think the problem with some of those condos is that they, they, they form in very strong condo associations and associations among the condo associations. And when something goes wrong in Alabama Park, they speak on it. Uh, and they have a lot of influence about, you know, how you develop, mm -hmm. uh, you know, copy line, rather, or, That's right. uh, the park. And um, then, of course, you have the problem of the homeless. So you have your hundred million dollar condo. You look straight down, and you see a blue tent. Uh, what's mm -hmm. wrong with this picture? So you know, the problem is that up till now, it's been a multi million dollar experience to buy a condo in Kaka'ako, multi million. And if we thought, you know, five or ten years ago, that we were going to have not only the, the aesthetic but the lifestyle and the 
Gemütlichkeit that you can find in this European village kind of uh, environment. Um, no, that didn't happen, but it costs you two or three million dollars to get in. And probably it's more than that now because, you know, prices have gone through the roof. Yeah. So it's probably three or four million dollars to get in. And so it, it can't be a place where some, some working stiff from downtown, you yeah. know, can live there. And this creates a problem on Sunday evening on um, 60 Minutes. There was a very interesting piece about the, these large corporations, one of them, the largest, I think, uh, headquartered in Toronto, buy homes all over the country at whatever the price is. Uh, they restore them to a limited degree, and then they rent them at extraordinarily high rents based on what they paid and the cost of renovation. <clears throat> and people mm -hmm. cannot afford to buy them because they're competing with these big companies. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, they can't afford to live in them as a, as a tenant because the rents are so high. Um, and I and I suggest to you that to the extent we were hoping for affordable in terms of purchase and affordable in terms of rental in Kaka'ako, we're miles away from that now. Yeah. Now, don't forget, uh, in, in all fairness, uh, there was a, a big project, uh, 801 South Street. Those condos, uh, there were two towers, about a thousand units, and they sold for four hundred to five hundred thousand, and that's maybe five years ago. Okay, so, and now there was another uh, big project uh, on Ward Avenue near Holly Cow Villa, uh, has a Long's Drugs in the base. Uh, those also were more in the six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollar range condos. Um, there, you know, that's that is a different cut of buyer, definitely. And there were a lot of local buyers in the in those two build in those two projects. Um, so, I think, like any city, your 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 prime views, your beachfront properties are going to be um, your expensive, you know, um, condos. And and as you move inland, you're going to get you're going to get a, a a wider range of cost and an affordability. So give Kakako some time. I just think in terms of, of housing and and that is a that is a crying need. We we have a huge need for housing throughout the city, throughout the island. Uh, uh, so we can't blame it all on Kakako. Um, they, if if the developers right now see the see the lucrative market in million dollar condos, um, you you have to rec you know you have to recognize market forces. But but I think the government has to be somewhat. Uh, involved in encouraging more affordable housing and then you, there are several isolated affordable housing projects in Kakako the government has been involved in one way or another either they furnished the land or they gave some kind of tax incentive but i think architecturally i i think we we haven't been we haven't really used uh, other means of lowering the cost of construction we we've insisted on on massive parking structures on all of these projects we can we can drop those you can you can you are not required to have two spaces per condo anymore kakako has discretion of to to drop it to like 0.5 uh parking per condo and so let's let's whack those those parking podiums they're not only creating canyons but they're creating huge expense a, a parking a parking stall alone even in a, in a multi uh multi-story structure is easily fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars so that that bumps up the cost of your unit so and then b we stop we stop this ridiculous over uh, emphasis on air conditioning every bloody square inch of our buildings this is this is just a criminal that we we insist on these glass skin towers that uh, uh are cause colossal energy use and colossal ma monthly maintenance fees for for the owners so Again, that's part of affordability. It, it's it's one thing even to buy a two million dollar condo, but don't forget you're going to pay three thousand a month on your maintenance fees on top 
of your mortgage fee. So those, so cut the parking, cut the air conditioning use. You use air conditioning in in a, in a much more uh, targeted fashion, with, whether it's in your kitchen or your bedroom. Uh, don't air condition every hallway, every public space. Uh, and that cuts cuts a, a huge amount off of your equipment costs and your meet your energy costs. So these are ways of creating more affordable housing in Takako. Well, you know, one of the things uh, that, that pops out of this, uh, for me anyway, is that if you have these expensive condos, um, millions or hundreds of millions, as the case may be, um, you're not really playing to the local market. You're not playing to those kids who are getting out of college and want to have a life here. You're sending them away because they could never afford those those condos, either in the purchase or the rental or yeah. or even the uh, operating expense, the common area maintenance. You know, it's so yeah. high. <clears throat> so it's just not a place for local people and local kids. And what happens is. I'm sure you'll agree that um, it was not a Hawaii resident that bought that $100 million condo. Um, it was somebody else from some faraway place. And, and so, uh, you know, what, the average Joe in this town can't afford two or three million. No way. And so what, what happens is these these condos are being have been and are being purchased and spun by people outside the state, even on second and third, you know, sale. Uh, yeah. the, the local people just aren't there, can't be there, won't be there. Um, and it's not going to get cheaper. It's going to get it is getting more expensive. So the promise yeah. of, 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 of providing housing for the people of Hawaii was not met. Uh, I remember Neil Abercrombie, you know, talking about how uh, this was going to provide housing for the people. It hasn't. Uh, furthermore, you know, the, the promise of a six story kind of walk up. I shouldn't say walk up. That would be uh, outside the ADA, wouldn't it? A six story building, um, you know, like the, the, all those renderings we saw. Not a chance. You have to have a bottom line. and The bottom line has been huge for some of these yeah. development companies. Well, don't don't um, don't. You will notice that there is really a difference, a fundamental difference between the Howard Hughes end of Kakako and the and the Kamehameha Schools end of Kakako at downtown. I agree. I I think uh, Kamehameha Schools, being a, a local investor and a local landowner, they are much more committed to to trying to attract and and provide an environment for the local buyer, and. Their vision of Kakako is is a lot closer, I think, to to uh, more reasonable, sustainable urban urban design. Uh, they are reusing some of their old buildings. Um, they're going low rise with some of their housing. I mean, as in six stories. And so, uh, I think there uh, there there's actually two different visions of of developers working there and. Clearly, Kamehameha Schools knows they're they're not going to just pick up in 25 years and say bye, you know. And that's Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes is just going to you know pocket their billions and and move back to Texas and 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 leave whatever's there. He, he, if it all gets submerged with sea level rise, that won't be their problem because they they have sold their projects and they have moved on and. Uh, that's the nature of of you know capitalist developers. Uh, so, you know, you know, you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, you know sea sea level rise and all that, and that was that was a big discussion in our meetings. You know, your AIA meetings back yeah. ten years ago. Everybody was worried that a you know there would be um, flooding. Um, B, there was a, a, an under underdeveloped uh, sewage system there uh, that would be a problem. Uh, and other infrastructure issues that that nobody wanted to belly up to, uh, including HCDA. And so uh, Kaka'ako was built ignoring those issues, at least yeah. as far as I know. And so, you know, it, but it, it, it creates a kind of handicap, doesn't it? That ultimately there will be sea level rise, guarantee right now here today with you. And, yeah. and that will affect those buildings. And ultimately the, uh, the underdeveloped infrastructure that is not adequate for the number of you know residents and apartments and all that uh that will bite somebody don't you think ah well that that is a uh 
when you say underdeveloped infrastructure, let's be sure we're not talking about sewage and water and electricity, because that that's what they spent the first 20 years building. So so Kakaako is totally at, I mean, it has capacity to build all those 50 towers that Howard Hughes wants to do in Kamehameha schools. They have the capacity. They they sure as heck are not prepared for sea level rise in that we all know the streets aren't any taller, aren't any higher in, in Kakaako. So what they have been doing though, is they have been jacking up um, all of the, the new new buildings, like uh, the one where the old Nobu restaurant is, the, that thing's a good five feet higher than the rest of the street. Mm. So, so basically, when you come out of your condo in 50 years, you will, instead of hiring an Uber, you're going to be hiring a gondola. <laughs> so that's that's it. it you, you, but you're, they literally are moving all of their electrical equipment up to higher floors so that water can actually come in on the ground floor of these buildings and not and not cause any kind of disruption other oh, than wow. you know yes you, yes your 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 feet are going to get wet as you wade through your six inches of water in the lobby <laughs> well you know but you you talk about building smart going forward um yeah. you know and being more efficient and not wasting with the glass covered buildings and yeah. lots of air conditioning and the like and all that um but query what's what's left what 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 is the acreage uh, last time i looked it was pretty much developed right up to queen street um is there more land there that we should be thinking about well right no really the what's got to be developed is is all that big area between howard hughes's chunk which is at the ala moana end and kamehameha schools chunk which is way down at the downtown end that there's there's really a lot of acreage there uh and moving malka um, i mean malka has really not been uh developed uh, as you know queen street is still the the headquarters for you know rubber slippers and auto body and uh, uh occasional bars and breweries <laughs> but uh yeah there you you get a, a wonderful sense of old kakako when you go on Queen, because there's the tiny little uh, land parcels in there, and there's um, kind of funky little shops, uh, so th there is still there's still a lot of room, a lot of land that needs to be worked on. Yeah, well, that's that's optimistic in the sense that um, if they if they listen to you and me mm -hmm. and other architects and engineers, they would. They would build smarter the next the next phase, you know. Um, yeah. But what 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 is the what is the reason they would have to do that? When, you know, it's not clear that the developer looking at the bottom line is going to build for love uh, yeah. or community or to uh, you know to make the city a better quality of life. Uh, no, he's going to look for uh, the bottom line. How how just how do we achieve what you are talking about? Yeah. Well, I, I think HCDA is a key because, again, they are the agency that that approves all construction and and they call the shots on on the form and the and the size and the location of buildings. Uh, they they just need to clamp down on these canyons. Uh, I, I, they've gotten a lot of things right. They have a complete streets program. They're they're really emphasizing street trees, uh, street furniture, uh, pedestrian walkways. It, you, you just have to realize that the things haven't really filled in entirely yet. Um, you know, you'll, so you'll see some blocks where, where there's, uh, they've, they've adequately um, kind of furnished the, the street and made it, made it attractive. And then you'll go to the next block and it's, and it's the old Kakako. It's, it's untouched and it's baking hot and it's, there's, you know, nothing but warehouses. Yeah. So um, I, but what I really am struck by in Kakako is the popularity of Kakako amongst the younger generations. They absolutely get it. Yeah. And it's so ironic. They can't possibly afford to live there. But yet the the youth, uh, you know, the twenty somethings and thirty and forty somethings of Honolulu, they make a beeline for Kakako at night, and they, they park in the structures and they go out, get out and walk, 
And um, so I think they they are attracted to the urban density. And, yes. I, and I think that is the thing that Kakako got right. They, they, have, they have gone back to a denser form of urban living and that creates opportunities for excitement and interaction um, amongst people that, uh, you know, it's, it's what makes New York great or Boston great or, or Philadelphia or San Francisco. So one of, um, one of the problems that gets in the way, though, is that the cost of land, because of all this construction, if I give you a condo that costs a fortune, that raises yeah. the appraised value of everybody in, in yeah. sight. And so um, so that you, you know, you have rent, the cost of occupancy is that much greater. And so if I want to establish a mom and pop or a restaurant, what have you, and try yeah. to participate in this village thing that you are describing, it's going to cost me a lot for rent. And I have to pass that on to those kids who don't have enough money to buy into it, who come down. I agree with you. I agree. Absolutely. Who come down for the excitement. And, and, and Kamehameha Schools has been very good about its contribution to that village quality. A lot of a lot of its land has been used for, you know, village type development, to uh, small shops and the like. The salt, the salt but, development is 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 a beautiful example of a reuse of a historic building. Um, of creating a, a more vibrant, uh, high density environment, retail environment, um, very popular. Uh, I, I think I think there's your hope right there. Uh, a lot, of, I, a lot of the first generation retail tenants have been forced out already. They cannot yeah. pay the rent, and yeah. so the, the, the it's really an odd situation where these kids who can't afford the apartments and who could not even live there as a tenant. They come down and they spend it. They live at home. They spend their last nickel in these yeah. expensive restaurants and bars and exciting places mm -hmm. and all that. But the, it, but those costs of those, you know, of being a consumer, of those places goes up and up. I, I don't know how this can be fixed. And that's my last question to you, Scott. How can this be fixed? How can we have what we hoped to have? We can expand doors. You know, across Queen Street, the, the ice, there is all that auto body shop land there. It's not yeah. the highest and best use if you no. consider all the multi, you know, million dollar condos. But, mm -hmm. the, but the question is, um, how can we expand this and refine it and perfect it and mm -hmm. fix it so that it is at least partly what we had hoped it would be as a uh, uh, an extension of the downtown, a... Yeah. Um, the metropolitan area. Yeah, it, it, it isn't really, I, I never quite agreed that it would be simply an extension of downtown. I think it's a unique neighborhood of its own sort of ilk. Uh, okay. It's a work, live, play. Downtown w was, is, an, is an older financial model, uh, which doesn't really function too well at night and on weekends, as you know. It, it isn't it isn't a place where you, a lot of people hang out uh, after after work hours. So I like the Kakako approach, which is much more integrated living environment, retail play. Um, and I and I think the key answer is is we have to um, we have to put pressure on HCDA when they when they bring up these public hearings and they say, well, Howard Hughes has a proposal to build a new tower over here uh, on this park. Um, we, need, we need to get in there and, and demand that, that the environment is not another canyon and that, and that um, you know, uh, there needs to be a, a wider range of housing types rather than just $3 million condos. How do you build um, a feasible building, you know, that's not a canyon building, that's not a huge, tall, you know, uh, stab in the sky kind of building, yeah. uh, and still have it um, affordable enough for yeah. for the uh, the next generation to enjoy uh, living there and 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 enjoy the life there. Yeah, you you take out, you cut the parking. You don't need parking. You're living in Kakako. Cut the parking. That cuts a hundred thousand dollars off the cost of every unit. You you cut the air conditioning. You, you can take fit, you know twenty five thousand dollars off of every unit if just by using judicious air conditioning and using natural ventilation. And 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 thirdly, 
you really ought to be using more landscaping in these high rises. No, we're we're being uh, outflanked by other countries in Southeast Asia that are using high rise landscaping in very creative ways to to shade and to create cooling, and to create much more uh, much more uh, amenable uh, park park spaces up and on the high levels of, of, of high rises so that high rises don't become just simply an elevator tower to nowhere. Uh, that you, you can actually drop down two floors and go into a little public park up on the 30th floor or the 20th floor or the 10th floor. And, um, and those are, I mean, those are, we have the perfect environment, the perfect climate for those kind of uh, uses of, of our natural our natural temperatures, and we're just not using them. And that all creates a much more affordable housing project. Yeah, and I would spend more time there, I'll, I'll tell you now. Um, one of the other things is, uh, uh, this. we don't have that much time left to, to talk about it, but in order to fix the situation, seems to me that you have to change the rules. You have to change the rules for HCDA, you have to change the rules for uh, the Department of Planning and Permitting to the extent they apply. And you have to yeah. change the, the tax rules because what happens is um, so I buy a, a condo for $2 million and the first thing, and I don't live there, nobody lives there. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's ancient and rather it's open, it's abandoned property really. Yeah. Um, and then I'm, all I'm doing is I'm getting my broker to try to spin it for three and $4 million and, and uh, so I can make a killing on, on the appreciation. And, and there are people who do that. It happens. It is yeah. happening. So Property, I think you could change the policy and stop yeah. that from happening. No? And our tax code does, it gives a, it gives a break for, for owner occupants. But then if you have a, a second property and you don't live in it, you, you pay a higher tax rate. And, and we can easily adjust those things. In, in the case of Kakaka, where you've got 80% vacancy in some of those luxury units like Hokua, that's that's ridiculous, and and we should we should be definitely jacking the the property rates of those absentee owners who are not even renting out those units. They're simply hanging on to them as investments. They're they're just they're just parking their money there because their money is not safe in Hong Kong or Taipei or Singapore or where, wherever they're coming. A, a lot of them are coming from Asia, and they're just using it as an investment. Yeah. So, we have to take we have to manage offshore investment i always yeah. felt that way and then we'll all be better off yeah. um and I, I, the other thing i wanted to say is i hope you can come back scott because we have miles to go before we sleep there are other <laughs> neighborhoods as as martin despang wrote to us this morning there are other issues architectural and planning yes. issues around the city when you mentioned as uh of course, uh, Chinatown uh, yeah. to you know perfect life in Chinatown. There are things mm -hmm. that can be done, and of course, Kalihi, because when you and I were doing our discussions about Kakaako, there was there was this thought that the next big neighborhood would be Kalihi, and nothing yeah. much has happened in Kalihi. But uh, what we have learned, what we are learning in Kakaako, don't you agree? Could be very informed, very important in developing Kalihi, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I could see I could see you know the the location of Kalihi makes it an absolute gem, and 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 a perfect candidate for for redevelopment uh, to 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 kind of match and complement the downtown. So, then you'll come back. Is I that, will come back. Okay. Happy to. Happy Scott to. Scott Wilson, architect and, and planner and a, a fellow who really cares a lot about the way our city develops. And that means the quality of life for all of us. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank Scott you Wilson. for having me.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.